Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful to you for this time and thank you very much, Lord, for giving us another opportunity that uh, all of us could uh, come together uh, and study your word together, O oh Lord. Lord, grant us the spirit that variants had and we may be people who go to scripture and we who study it and may understand it and may experience you more closely, O oh Lord. Lord, I pray our discussions may be fruitful and they may be encouraging and uh, 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 and they may be equipping everybody that participate, O oh Lord. We want to hear your voice and we ask for your grace so that we may be able to receive it and perceive it, the great truth that you want to reveal to us, O oh Lord. Grant us the courage to change our minds and hearts and to truly repent and accept the truth about you and your love, O oh Lord. May the words of our mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Praveen. And once again, uh, welcome to our weekly Bible study. Uh, I can see Franklin Poppins has now joined us. Welcome, Franklin. Uh, uh, Miss, uh, I think it is Mrs. Noah. We haven't seen her, but uh, I'm glad that she is there also with us. Well, um, once again, we are taking a, a break from the usual pattern that we employ with regards to our Bible study. Uh, we have been going through uh, the series that we call We Believe. That is basically our statement of faith. Uh, we wanted to understand all of those statements in a more in-depth manner. And so we have been going through that. But uh, over the past two weeks now, we haven't used that. But we will get back to that. Instead, today, I thought uh, of playing a video uh, and then get into a discussion. All right. Let me just bring you some thoughts about the video. Uh, before Praveen can play it for us. Uh, the title of the, the discussion, it's actually a conversation between uh, two theologians, uh, Daniel Tamel and uh, Mike, uh, Mike Fazell. And of course, it is part of our you, Your Included series, or our, our video presentations on our website. Now, I'm presuming some of you may have already watched it, but... Uh, it's been a while, hopefully you've, you, you've seen it, and then uh, nevertheless, we can have a discussion on it. Uh, the discussion centers around uh, Jesus Christ. The title is actually Christ Atoned for Everyone. And this aspect of Christ atoning for everyone, when you say everyone, all of humanity, has been a bit controversial uh, with regards to some people not necessarily subscribing to that. For example, you must have heard of Calvinism. Uh, John Calvin is the one who brought this kind of thinking uh, into, the, into the Christian church. And John Calvin um, was asked the question, why is it that some people respond to the gospel while others don't? And then he went on to explain it to say that this means that some people are some people are predestined or elected to be saved, and some people are actually predestined to be damned. <laughs> that is how he explained it. In other words, Christ's atonement does not apply to those who are predestined to be lost. Uh, that's how he explained it. Uh, now, of course. Daniel Timel, of course, is, a, uh, is, is an expert in some of these uh, teachings, and he feels that maybe John Calvin was not fully or properly understood, uh, but that's, that's another subject. But Calvinism as such uh, has become quite um, you know, popular. Uh, you may have heard of the Reformed theology. Most of Reformed theology embraces this, and there are people like uh, John MacArthur and... Uh, who was the man who passed away? R.C. Sproul, 
these people have been subscribing to what they call as a reformed theology. And they believe that only some have been elected to be saved, uh, predestined. And God has, uh, you know, okay, God has, you know, predestined some actually to be lost. So there is some discussion on that. I'm sure you will find it interesting. There is a little talk on uh, repentance. Then, of course, he also discusses another theologian's teaching. His name is Karl Barth. Once again, you must have heard of him. Karl Barth was uh, someone who wrote very extensively. And uh, uh, Karl Barth has a different take on this whole aspect of predestination. He said, our predestination is in Christ. In other words, our election is in Christ. In other words, Christ is the one who has been elected as the human being representing all human beings. Uh, he did not die only for some. He is, his death was, you know, inclusive of all humanity. So Karl Barth brings up some interesting thing. But what happened is they accused Karl Barth of teaching something called universalism. Universalism means is exactly the opposite of John Calvin or Calvinism. Calvinism says some are saved. Universalism says everybody is saved. In other words, there's nobody is going to go to hell. Everyone is going to be saved. All right. Uh, so, but uh, 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 Daniel Thimel in his discussion uh, says that actually Karl Barth did not teach universalism, but he taught universal atonement, which means that Christ's atonement is applicable to everyone. All right. So maybe you will hear it as he talks about it. Uh, okay, then of course, there is a, a short uh, discussion on how is it that some people are lost and uh, the discussion moves towards how some people close their minds and they don't respond to the gospel because they don't want to, they have a choice to, uh, the gospel is given and they have to accept it, they have to receive it, not that they can create their own salvation or engineer their own salvation. But unless they receive it, they don't act. I mean, they are not able to experience it. And uh, Daniel Thimel basically comes down to say that it is basically spiritual pride that makes people to reject Jesus Christ. So this is basically the discussion that is going on. I thought I'll give you a little heads up. Uh, obviously, the discussion is fairly uh, heavy, uh, heavy theology. Uh, so listen to it carefully and then let's come back and, uh, you know, we can entertain some some discussion. If you have any questions, feel free to write them down. So let me request Praveen to play the video for us. The following program is a presentation of Grace Communion International and Grace Communion Seminary and is made possible by generous donations from viewers like you. On this episode of You're Included, theologian Dr. Daniel Thamel explains that Jesus Christ won a completed salvation for each of us. Our host is Dr. J. Michael Fazell. Thanks for joining us. Glad to be here again. One of the things that you're particularly interested in, or a couple of things, is the theology of John Calvin as well as the theology of Karl Barth. Uh, could you... In a nutshell, even though that's quite a tall order, give us a little comparison between the two. Yeah, it's it's interesting that Bart, when he uh, when he saw the bankruptcy of liberal theology, realized that it had nothing to give to the people. Uh, when he saw Kaiser Wilhelm's aggressive war policies in World War One, uh, returned to the strange new world of the Bible. And he began to discover uh, a, a transcendent God, not a domesticated little house pet that, that liberal theology, uh, he thought, had made him to be. He began to, to rediscover uh, in the writings of, of Calvin and, and th those in the Reformed tradition a tremendous emphasis on grace and, uh, and a, a much higher view of Scripture. Uh, Calvin has a great deal to offer the Christian church because of his strong emphasis on grace. Uh, he has a wonderful 
discussion uh, in book three of, of the Institute's chapter three when he talks about uh, the difference between legal and evangelical repentance. And he says legal repentance is basically says that that if you uh, turn from your sins and if you're sorry enough, if you turn over a new leaf, then God will reward you with salvation. As it happens, this is the kind of teaching that was being presented uh, in the church of Calvin's day uh, before the Reformation, that, uh, that it's our performance, our obedience, our self-reformation that... Uh, that uh, merits us or makes us eligible for God's grace. Calvin said, no, that's, uh, that's legal repentance. That's, uh, that's a denial of grace. That's a denial of what God has done in Christ. And he said that uh, a proper answer is uh, evangelical repentance, a repentance, a gospel-based repentance, a, a, a lifelong uh, uh, turning from sin and, and growing in Christ uh, through grace, that actually repentance is a gift of God. It's not something that we uh, bring up in order to earn or win God's favor. Uh, this is a wonderful emphasis on grace. And uh, Calvin, through much of his theology, is, is very Christ-centered. And he says this is the only way of restoring pure doctrine is, is to, to hold up Christ uh, in, in all that he is. Uh, however, uh, when Calvin comes to, his, uh, to the question of why all don't respond favorably to the gospel, why when the gospel is preached, uh, some say yes and others say no, and having already emphasized that it's all by grace, he, he, he said, well, then the answer must be that some uh, were never intended to receive grace. Um, in Calvin's defense, although I, I, I take issue with him there, uh, in Calvin's defense, it was the way he was reading scripture. Uh, he, he thought that Romans 9 through 11 where God says, shall the potter say to the clay, why hast thou made me thus? I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. He, he thought that it was scriptural, that God, for some mysterious reason, decided from all eternity that he would save A and B and C, but he would not save X, Y, and Z. Uh, and this was not based on anything he would see in their life, any goodness or performance or anything. It was his mere will. When, when Bart read this part of Calvin, he said, uh, he's departed from Christ here. He's not reading uh, the gospel through the lens of Christ anymore. He's departed from his professed Christ-centered aim. And so uh, Bart said a proper uh, a, a doctrine of God's call and even God's predestination is already given us in Ephesians, where Ephesians says we're predestined in Christ. Now, if we have a Christ-centered doctrine of predestination, we don't have a God of a double decree, a God who arbitrarily decides to save some and, and damn others from all eternity, but a God who loves everyone and who sends Christ to die for everyone and, and who, who uh, underwrites everyone's responsibilities in the life and cross of his Son. Uh, Bart represents a significant Christological correction, if you will, of, uh, of John Calvin. There's much to, uh, to appreciate about Calvin. I have to disagree with his understanding of, of election. I, I might mention in passing that it's fascinating that, uh, that Calvin did teach that Christ died for the world. If you read his commentary on John 3.16, he says, world means world. The world of all lost sinners. That Christ died for all sinners. And so he, he taught two uh, incompatible doctrines. One, that Christ died for the world, and two, that God never planned to save uh, the non-elect. That he only planned to save a few certain ones by name. Uh, and it was later the, the high Calvinists, as they are sometimes called, who tried to resolve that conflict in Calvin's teaching by making him consistent. They revised his theology to say uh, that God only planned to save certain ones, and they're the ones Jesus died for and none other. They were the ones that were the least happy uh, with Bart, with his uh, Christological correction of Calvin. They, they wanted to retain the God of will, the God, of, the God who is pure will and who can do whatever he wants. And he, if he only wants to save some, they should consider themselves lucky and the rest of them can go to hell because they deserve it anyway. 
and that doesn't reflect the will of God as he's presented in Christ. Mm -hmm. Christ presents a completely different picture of who the Father is and what the Father's will is. Yes, he says, he who has seen me has seen the Father. And, and uh, uh, there isn't any other God lurking behind the back of Jesus. The Bible says in, in Hebrews, uh, in many and various ways, God spoke of old to our ancestors by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son whom he appointed heir of all things. Jesus Christ is the word of God made flesh. He, he's a full revelation of God. We, we don't need to fear that there's some bad news somewhere else. Jesus Christ in his unconditional love for the woman caught in adultery, his forgiveness of her and telling her to sin no more, uh, in his uh, acceptance of a, of, a, of a greedy tax collector, um, showed that, that God is, is a, a God of unconditional love and mercy who, who welcomes every sinner into his embrace to receive his salvation already won for them. So, so Bart represents, uh, to my mind, uh, a significant uh, advance on the thinking of Calvin. Even though there's much in Calvin that is that is rich, and and I still uh, appreciate and learn from. Now, Bart is sometimes called a universalist. Um, how does that? Uh, where does that come from? And uh, what? Uh, what is it based on? Yes, uh, 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 you often hear that charge. I imagine a person could go Google on the Internet or they could go and even read some uh, theological dictionaries and, and learn there that, that Bart's a universalist. And uh, I, I, can, I can say to you with, with a full confidence that that is simply not the case. Uh, it's interesting that when, when I was a student at Fuller Seminary in Pasadena, uh, I was privileged to take a, a BART seminar taught by none other than Jeffrey Bromley, who uh, was the co-editor of the Church Dogmatics in English, who translated most of its volumes. So he knew a little bit about BART. And uh, I chose for, uh, for my paper in his class, uh, the, the topic, Is BART a Universalist? And I went chapter and verse. I looked through all the passages I could find in the dogmatics where he speaks to the subject. It seems clear that Bart was absolutely convinced of a universal atonement. Bart believed that Jesus Christ assumed the humanity of every single human being, and that when he died, they died. When he rose, they rose. He really did pay the price and win a complete, a completed salvation for them. And I think there's something in the human heart that is so used to thinking, well, there's something I need to do. There's a, there's a 5% or a 10% I need to contribute. I mean, yes, Jesus did this wonderful work on the cross and, and he died for my sins, but, but that's not quite enough. And so very often, in fact, uh, the gospel will be preached by well-meaning evangelists in this way. They'll, they'll describe in moving terms about all that God has done in Jesus, about how, how Christ lived a, an absolutely faithful life and an upright life, and he endured the contradiction of sinners and, and was always upright, and that how he died a brutal death and how he died as a substitute for our sins, and, and he has paid it all, they'll say. But then having said, this is what Jesus has done, then they will say, and now this is what you must do in order to get in order to get in on it, that you need to turn from sin, read your Bible, go to church. Now, of course, all of these things are, are, are enjoined upon Christians, but they're not conditions of salvation. It's not as if I have to do certain things in, in order to be worthy of it. Um, I'm included in Christ because 2,000 years before I was born, he lived my life and died my death and rose in triumph. And when he rose, I rose. Now, people who are used to thinking in, in, in those kind of conditional terms don't understand when Bart says that it's complete. And so people think, well, if he says it's complete and, and that there's nothing that I have to do in order to earn salvation, then he's a universalist. But that's not what he's saying. He's simply saying that, there's, that, that we can't earn the salvation. It's, it's a completed gift in Christ. But he also says, 
in many places in his dogmatics, in his church dogmatics, that that if we deny the Lord who bought us, if we if we refuse to acknowledge that in Christ God has uh, has done it all, then we can be nailed to that denial for eternity. And so you, uh, the, the the sinner in hell uh, for Bart is the ultimately insane the ultimate insane person. He's denying reality. He's di denying that Christ died for him. And uh, and it isn't that the, the price isn't paid. It's that he's unwilling to accept it. Uh, there is an illustration which has sometimes been used that I think helps clarify what Bart is saying here. Uh, that uh, there, there's there's a there's a, a story that I'm told that is true of a man who was convicted of murder, sentenced to life in prison. And some years later, the governor decided to commute his sentence. And so the governor issued a pardon and said, so-and-so is hereby pardoned for, for his crimes and, and, and may be set free from prison. And this pardon was brought to this prisoner. It was already completed. There was nothing he could do to earn it, win it. His name was already on it. But that prisoner, in fact, refused. He says, no, I've done the crime and I'll do the time. I will not accept this pardon. And legally, he could not be forced to leave that prison even though the pardon was there for him. Uh, hell, hell, hell is, uh, is a monument to the person who says, my will be done, not thine, O Lord. And so this is really what Bart is saying. And interestingly, after I, uh, after I finished that, that paper and turned it into Professor Bromley, I, I might add that he wrote a note on that paper that, that it indicated uh, a, 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 a careful research of Bart typically lacking in studies on the subject. I, I think many people uh, have, have not given Bart a fair hearing because they've heard some scare story. Oh, he's a universalist. Well, he's yeah, not a universalist. I, I think Cornelius Van Til it, it is, comes up, a quote from him, or from Francis Schaeffer, when you do a Google search. Yes. Van Til was, was very warm towards Bart, or maybe we could say hot behind the collar. <laughs> he wrote a book famously titled Christian Christianity and Bardianism, which gives us some idea of how he saw the two standing. Uh, even though here's someone who believes in the in the Trinity, in the Incarnation, and in the substitutionary atonement of Christ, and the inspiration of Scriptures, and he's he's described as being a, someone who's departed completely from Christianity. I think Van Til uh, was so unhappy with Bart's rejection of double predestination and his emphasis on a universal atonement, that he, he, he really approached Bart, I, I would have to say, with a, with a closed mind. Even though he had a fine mind, it was closed when it came to Bart. Now, most of us suffer from that in one way or another from time to time. I oh, I, 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 I know. I, I'm, I'm very open to my own ideas. You know? <laughs> uh, scripturally speaking, 1 John uh, 2, 2, I think, uh, one and two together to talk about uh, well, Christ's atonement reaches not just our sins, but the sins of the, the whole, whole world. world. And then Colossians 1 talks about uh, how in God was in Christ reconciling all things. Yes, yes, and in and, and, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, God was in Christ reconciling the world uh, to himself. So and these are words that are not... In particular, the uh, world, it actually means uh, world. That's right. And all things actually means all things. That's right. Whenever you have to add italicized words to a verse in order to make it square with your theology, you're in trouble. <laughs> Whenever you have to say, God so loved the world of the elect that he gave his only son. <laughs> or, even there, the definition of elect uh, is rooted again in, in Paul in, in Ephesians 1. Right. Christ is the elect. We all are elect in him. That's right. That's right. God loves all of us equally. He cherishes each one of us equally. He, as it were, he carries a picture of each of us in his wallet. He, each one of us is dear to God. And, and, and when, when he went to the cross, the, the, the face, all our faces were upon his heart. And he, he, he is overwhelmed with joy. The, the heavens rejoice when one sinner uh, returns to him and receives the salvation already won for him. Yeah, uh, there's, a, there's a refusal 
that we're free to, as it were, free to make. Uh, yes, that's like, right. like the fellow in, in prison. Uh, he, he refuses the pardon. Who can explain that? He likes it better in prison. It, it's, it works to the way he is better or something. Yes. But for whatever reason, he refused it. Yes. Uh, there, there's a, and I haven't seen maybe the movie. His, maybe his sense of justice. Yes, sometimes it's that. But I think very often uh, it's a sense of pride. Uh, not in a, uh, in, in that, you know, well, uh, I'm not going to uh, uh, kneel before this man and, and confess that he did what I could not do. He died my death and he paid the price. I, you know, I'm a dignified person. I don't need to humble myself and accept Christ as Savior. But the Bible talks about someone, uh, 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 someone trampling underfoot the covenant. It says, how should we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Paul, having given this wonderful statement of the universal, uh, universal, uh, universally completed atonement, says God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And then he says, we beseech you on behalf of God, be reconciled. Yeah. In other words, you're already reconciled. The world's over. But you need to be reconciled in your own heart. You need to receive that which is already completed for you. So to, 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 to declare a, a completed uh, atonement, to say yes when Jesus hanging from the cross said it is finished, does not mean uh, universalism. It does not mean that we can just say, well, that's fine, then we can just go our merry way. No, it means that we need to, we're, we're encouraged to believe, to receive, to accept. Uh, the passage, How Shall We Escape If We Neglect So Great a Salvation, I grew up in, in a hearing preached the, at the very opposite of its actual meaning. The idea was, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation in the sense of neglecting to obey the rules and keep the rules that are going to give you this salvation, uh, as opposed to... Uh, how can we be saved if we neglect the very thing that has already saved us? Right. Yeah, that would be, uh, as you imply, turning that uh, verse on its head because it's talking about this wonderful salvation where God and Christ has done it all. Uh, 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 a true salvation, uh, uh, one of grace. Um, Jesus, from hanging from the cross, said, it is finished. He didn't say, we're almost there. And if they just do their part, if they just keep enough of the laws, yeah. he said, it is finished. It's completed. It's far beyond our poor power to add or detract. All we can do is humbly accept it and live a life, as John McLeod Campbell says, of joyful repentance. A lot of times we have, we're, we're given the impression that, that you are saved by grace, uh, and that's the starting point. But then if you want to maintain that position, you need to obey well enough or it'll be taken away from you. You'll lose it. Yeah. Yeah, it's as if, as if God pulls the old switcheroo on us. Yeah, you know, bait, the, bait and switch. Bait and switch. At first, it's all grace. That's the good news. But now here comes the bad news. Now you're on probation for the rest of your life. Yeah. And, and, and now you, you better do this and you better not do that or else. Uh, my God is consistent. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is consistent. He is always a God of mercy and always a God of grace. And grace is not just the, the beginning point of the Christian life. It's, it's the, the continuing basis and foundation for our life in Christ. The Christian life is not a basis, it's not based in uh, my attitudes or my actions. It's based in the life of Christ. Um, the Bible again and again describes a Christian as one who is in Christ. Um, Paul says, if a man is in Christ, he's a new creation. He says, uh, you have died and your life is hidden with Christ. I'm hidden with Jesus. Paul says, I'm seated in the heavenlies with, with, uh, with Jesus. In Ephesians 1, I re he's given us every blessing in Christ. And, uh, and, and, and so my life in God is grounded in Christ. He's the basis for my acceptance before the Father, not my performance. In fact, this was the Galatian heresy, that, that in fact you begin in grace and then you maintain it by works. Uh, now, this is not to say that, in fact, works don't matter. It's not to say that obedience doesn't matter, that living a godly life, doing the will of God is irrelevant. It's to say 
that it, it's not a basis for for uh, keeping your salvation. So how does that work together then? I, I think that the answer to that lies in in Christ. That he uh, when when uh, when First Corinthians one thirty says he is our sanctification. Now that's an interesting statement. Because uh, the other point of view that you mentioned would have to deny that, would have to say, no, no, I'm my sanctification. Jesus does justification. He's the one who gets me right with God, and then I do the sanctification. I make myself holy. I make myself good enough. I keep myself in salvation. And we even use the, ter use the Holy Spirit in that mix by saying, well, the Holy Spirit leads us, but if we don't follow then we don't have sanctification. Yeah, I, I think, if, if again, if we understand that, that, that Christ is our righteousness and he's our sanctification, I think this helps us. In other words, when, when I come to God in Christ, I'm accepted for who I am in Christ, not for who I am in Dan Thamel, not because I've been so good or so worthy or so earnest or so consistent, but what I had to offer him, as Bill Gaither said, was brokenness and strife. And, uh, and he accepted that. But I'm accepted for who I am in Christ. In Christ, um, I am, I'm accepted by the Father. In Christ, um, I, am, I stand holy before the Father. I stand pure before the Father in his humanity. Now, justification then, sometimes we're told it's just as if I'd never sinned. A better definition is... To be justified is to be accepted for who I am in Christ. Because I was there in him. He, my humanity was carried by him throughout his life and in his death on the cross. Now, I, I, I got this from James Torrance, and I am un, unashamedly I'm using that as, as a central point of my own belief. Uh, to be justified is to be accepted for who, who I am in Christ, and then to be sanctified is what? It's to become who I am in Christ. So the amazing good news of the gospel is that Jesus Christ is your future because he's your past. I, my whole life is enclosed in Christ. I, I'm hidden with Christ in God. So I, I'm not tremblingly tiptoeing on the precipice every day of my Christian life. I'm rather living joyfully in Christ, realizing that sometimes I let him down, sometimes I, I struggle with the same old sins, sometimes I look inside me and see ugly attitudes, sometimes I say hurtful things, sometimes I, I'm not as faithful as I ought to be to my calling, but when, when we are faithless, he is faithful, Paul says, for he cannot deny himself. You see, I'm included in him. And so he's faithful. And I, 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 I believe that one day I'll stand before the Father and he will throw his arms around me and say, well done, good and faithful servant, because my life is included in Jesus. So when Paul says that this new life is hidden uh, in Christ, he means what he says. It's, it's hidden even from us. Most of the time we don't even see it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, it reminds me of the passage that also Paul mentions. We, we look in the mirror, and it's as though we see uh, a poor reflection. Yes. Uh, we don't see who we really are in Christ. We see what you were just describing, the person who falls short, the person who is weak, the person who doesn't measure up. But Scripture assures us Christ has already made us new, and that new person is hidden in Christ waiting to be revealed at the time when we see him face to face. Yes. And we see ourselves really as he's made us to be in him face to face for the first time. That's right. If we want to see who we are in Christ, we need to look at Christ. The mistake is we look at ourselves yes. and then we get discouraged. I, I, this is what it means to walk by faith and not by sight. We're always tempted to walk by sight. And we look in that mirror and we look a little too closely in that mirror. And we get depressed and we get discouraged. And Satan whispers in our ear, you're not worthy of the gospel. You're not worthy of being a minister. You're not worthy of being a Christian. And of course, we're not worthy. Right. <laughs> and when the prodigal son comes home to the father and says, I'm no more worthy to be called your son. Uh, the father is saying, in effect, who ever said this was about worthiness? You never will worthy, right. but you're my boy, and I love you. I've right. always loved you, and, and my forgiveness is here for you. So we don't walk by, by sight. 
but by faith in Christ. And, and, and I think that is the secret for living the Christian life, is to abide in Christ, to look in Christ, to gaze upon Christ, to live our lives out of the resources we have in Christ. And so Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ. It may not look like it, but I am. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yes, I do live. It's a vital, vibrant uh, life. But the life I live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. I live by His faith. And, and He loved me and He gave Himself for me. I'm His. Okay. Thank you, Praveen, for playing that video for us. Uh, we've got 10 minutes. And uh, uh, let's... Uh, if, if any any comments that you'd like to make, anything that struck you, uh, any questions that you might have, um, I'll open it up right now for for any of your comments. Well, while you're thinking about it, you know I I just uh, found that story. You remember the story he mentioned about the person who was convicted for murder and then he was actually given a pardon and he refused to take the pardon. Uh, I thought that was a very interesting way to show how people, uh, you know, have, I mean, uh, have chosen to be in hell. God doesn't, you know, put us in hell, but we have chosen to be in hell. Like C.S. Lewis says, the gates... The door to hell is closed from the inside. <laughs> so uh, um, that is, that is, I think, one way we see that uh, even though Christ has uh, universally atoned for all sin of all humanity, and yet there will be some who will reject that. And uh, Daniel Timmel calls it the ultimate insanity when you, uh, when you uh, reject reality. All right. Sir, I uh, like one statement that he said. Nelson, go ahead. I, I, I rejoice in Christ. Not that I am perfect, but with my shortcomings in that confidence that Christ has paid it for me in the future and in the past. So I rejoice in Christ. That statement has captivated me. Yes. Yes, you're very right, Anand. Uh, it, it's a very powerful statement, actually. Uh, and I think it comes from this misunderstanding that uh, I am saved by grace, but then I have to maintain my salvation through works. Uh, and, you know, we can never be perfect. And like uh, Nelson was mentioning, uh, we look at the perfection of Jesus. Uh, we don't have any perfection of, on our own. So our sanctification is also in Jesus, not in our works. We graciously participate in the life of Christ by doing all the good things. But ultimately, Christ is the one who has made it all possible. Yeah. Thanks, Anand, for that thought. Amen. I guess one of the... Uh, 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 one of the questions a lot of people ask is um, if I am if if I am one saved then I am I always saved <laughs> right that's a question a lot of people ask uh, once again uh, our salvation is what Christ has accomplished nobody can uh, take that away but the only way we don't experience it is by rejecting it. So it's a it's the rejection. It is not that we are imperfect uh, that you know will make us lose in experiencing salvation. It is a rejection of it that will make us not experience it. So just some thoughts to clarify that. All right. Anil, uh, you mute your, unmute yourself. Thank you. Can I say something? Yes, go ahead, Bertie, and then we'll get Anil to comment. No, let, let Anil speak first. 
Okay. Uh, Anil. Pravin, can you unmute Anil? Uh, I think he's struggling. Yeah. Ah, there you are. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Anil, go ahead. Okay, thank you. No, I was going to say that uh, when people uh, talk about universalism, they say, yes, Jesus died for everybody. So everybody is saved. In a sense, that may be correct. But even there, like uh, the story of that prisoner who refused, every, he did, Jesus did die for everybody and his death applies to everybody. But then they have to accept it. When we say that we are chosen and others are not, we have accepted his uh, uh, sacrifice for us and that's how we are, are saved. While the others, although th th Jesus died for them also, they have not accepted his uh, sacrifice and hence they have rejected it. Am I right in saying that? Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, just to uh, uh, bring a little bit more clarity to that, when a gift is given to you, how do you enjoy that gift? It's only when you receive it. When you accept it, <laughs> if you if you throw the gift away, you don't experience the the joy of of that gift. So salvation is a gift in Jesus, and we have the free will to reject it. And that is uh, that's another Christian doctrine that we are created with free will. Yeah, does that help, Anil? Yep, yeah, absolutely. Right. Go ahead, Bertie. Go ahead. Uh, the Bible mentioned that the, uh, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. We know the gospel is Jesus Christ. Uh, we know he is the power and wisdom of God. Wisdom he is a righteousness. He is a sanctification. He is a redemption. And uh, but, but, you know, there are false gospels that are going out. How do we um, Zechariah, how do we, you know, we are told to be partners in the gospel. Uh, as the household of God, we are supposed to be living and sharing the gospel. Uh, my point is the gospel reveals, the true gospel is the power, uh, which uh, God calls it the preaching of the word. You know, uh, while the world doesn't accept, but God uses preaching of the gospel to save people. Of course, God, as we know all that, that Christ has provided atonement for all mankind. He is, done the finish, he is the finished work. And we need to be in Christ. We are, uh, we, as uh, Nelson says, we rejoice. We read the word and we see so much, uh, you know, we give joy and it lifts us up and strengthens us. Uh, uh, my, my point is, if we neglect that, uh, we tend to uh, just for the benefit of us all, if we try tend to neglect uh, the word of God, the reading, the you know the prayer uh, uh, about you know the uh, the joy of salvation and the salvation uh, God has accomplished in Christ for all mankind, and we who are saved in Christ, called to participate in the communion fellowship, called to participate in mission. If we read, if we don't have the word uh, growing in us, there is uh, we can be low, we can be you know. We can be brought low, so to speak. So I'm, I'm wondering what your question is, Bertie. Uh, is your question, if I don't read my Bible, if I don't uh, pray, am mm. I, have I lost my salvation? No, 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 no. We, don't, we need to sustain ourselves by that. Okay. All right. So uh, what you're saying is, as I read, as I study, as I, uh, you know, uh, enjoy uh, the benefits of obedience... I am participating in my salvation. Yes, yes, right. Yes, that is. Be sustained. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know uh, that uh, for our fellow brothers and sisters, if we if we tend to neglect it in the sort in a way, the Holy Spirit is uh, saying, "Look, you're not you're not enjoying the reality of your salvation. You uh, th those are the means of sustenance for us. You know, God says, you know, it is food and drink for us. Yes." Yeah, accept it. Uh, yes, you must. I mean, like I was saying earlier, when you receive a gift, you actually unwrap the gift box and you take out the gift and you use it. Uh, that's experiencing uh, yeah. the gift. And you have to do that also with your salvation in Christ. Uh, and if you don't, obviously you're not experiencing in the fullness yeah. uh, of it. Right? So, but just to make sure that, you know, we understand that uh, 
you know, you know, uh, our salvation is not lost or we don't maintain it by any kind of work. Right. Okay. Praveen, you had any thoughts uh, to add? Okay. Uh, I have, I, oh, I'm, I want to add something. It's, yes. If we have a relationship with, uh, it's a but my point is the relationship with God. So if we have more relationship, we, we, we nurture the relationship, it the gets Bible better study. by Bible study and yeah. prayer, it gets better. Absolutely. I mean, uh, it's uh, once that uh, the word relationship, of course, is uh, something which we cherish a great deal. Uh, <laughs> even, even, you know, uh, a friend, a family member, how can you enjoy, uh, you know, and rejoice in that person? It's only in a relationship. Uh, and if that relationship is not there, obviously, uh, you have no opportunity to enjoy the other person. Okay. Uh, all right. I slowly, time is slipping away. Uh, uh, some, uh, Bertie, you mentioned something about false gospel. Uh, you know, in fact, in fact I was just, just came to my mind, why don't we have a booklet, uh, you know, uh, uh, in a uh, title, The True Gospel. <laughs> okay. Uh, the the, good news, we, have a, we have a booklet that says, uh, Saved, What Next? And... Yeah. Uh, uh, the God revealed in Jesus Christ. Beautiful books, both. But how about my, you know, my just my suggestion, okay. uh, as you know, to give out the reading material, you know, as as a way of evangelizing, right. and you know, the uh, the true gospel, and uh, you know, the true gospel, Jesus, Jesus Christ, like that, something. Well, uh, yeah. Thanks for the suggestion. Uh, we will. Uh, file it away and hopefully we will come out with uh, some kind of a booklet. But you, you, if you remember, we, I think, had a bo booklet like that in the past. And we used to say that the true gospel is the kingdom of God, the message of Jesus. Yeah. If you remember, uh, we gave more importance to that message rather than the person. <laughs> That's where we made the mistake. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, I think... Uh, uh, the time has gone by. It's uh, uh, an hour plus. Uh, thank you very much again for joining us. Uh, hopefully by, uh, the, by the next uh, Bible study, we will get back into our, uh, uh, into our We Believe series. So um, we will do our readings and our discussions. Bertie, can I request you then to close in prayer? Sure. Let's bow our heads. Father God, we just want to thank you so much for bringing us together on this technology platform, Lord, and uh, um, hearing, Lord, uh, uh, watching the video, and also, Lord, the discussion and the points, uh, important points, Lord. Uh, but, Lord, nevertheless, Lord, uh, it is all pointing to your grace and mercy, your love, your forgiveness, your new creation, all, Lord, well, how wonderfully accomplished in the person of Jesus Christ. Lord, we believe God came in the flesh. It's still coming in the flesh and the people you have called, Lord, who are in the spirit that dwells in us. And Lord, we need your help, Father. We need our eyes on you, as uh, Rekha and others uh, mentioned, Nelson and others. Lord, we need a relationship. We need to be, Lord, looking to you and acknowledging, as Mr. Zachariah said, the gift. We need to receive it, open it, and experience it. Lord, we thank you for all that you have planned and accomplished for us. We thank you for your salvation in Christ. We thank you for the word that is with us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that indwells in us. We give you thanks for the living hope, Lord. And Lord, for all that you, uh, in your love, uh, planned in creation and planned for each of us. Thank you, Father, for this time. Thank you for all that we have discussed. And thank you, Lord, for helping us to grow. Uh, in, in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We just thank you, Lord, for uh, accepting us in your beloved, sanctifying us in your beloved. Thank you for the redemptive work done in Christ for us all. Lord, we want to see many more saved here, yeah? Lord, as you only know. And Lord, we just want to be instruments in your hands, Lord, to live and share the gospel. Thank you, Father, for this time and bring us next uh, for the worship.
uh, virtual worship, Lord, uh, on Sunday. And uh, let a blessing be upon one and all of us. Father, we pray this prayer in the gracious and blessed name of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.